Three Deeper Cuts. hoo Hello, it's your host, Chuck G. Welcome to the podcast, Three Deeper Cuts, your lifestyle magazine for the practicing surgical pathologist. Every week we bring you something to think about, something to read, or something to listen to. Three Deeper Cuts is brought to you by Formalin Fix Paraffin Embedded Tissue. Emphasis on the formalin? Because without the high exposure of 10% buffered neutral formalin that I experienced during my four years of residency in St. Louis, I wouldn't be able to think of half of the things that I write about here on Three Deeper Cuts Publishing. And if you're not a pathologist and you're listening to this right now, thank you and welcome. A couple of announcements for today. Another week down in the trenches of community practice in a hospital built on a sacred Indian burial ground where the diseases just seep up through the soil and into the plumbing, through the hallways, up the HVAC, and onto my desk in the form of an H&E slide. Good week, ladies and gentlemen. Turns out uh, I was voluntold to serve on my institution's PPEC committee. Everybody, every hospital's got a PPEC committee. So if you're tuned into this podcast, you're going to get an inside scoop on what goes on in the trenches of community medicine. How does a hospital work from the inside out, the belly of clinical practice? So you don't know what a pathologist is. I'll, I'll tell you. Okay. Uh, we look at human diseases under a microscope and render a diagnosis. And the doctor up on the floor, the hospitalist, the oncologist, the surgeon, make clinical management and treatment decisions based upon what we diagnose and what we grade and what we stage. Pathologists also look at the metrics at the clinical lab, management of the clinical lab. Fortunately, I have not, I have not done a whole lot of that lately. And, uh, I'd like to keep it that way. If you, if you, if you know what I'm saying, Uh, those are two completely different lines of laboratory medicine and, uh, hats off to the people that do both simultaneously. Uh, I think it, it, actually that's not true. I do do some of the clinical lab stuff, but, uh, it's, it's the easier stuff and the, the more seasoned professionals do the more complicated stuff. So everyone's got to pitch in, in the trenches of community practice. So that's basically what the pathologist does. It's a great job. I get to sit in a cave, look at tissue, uh, listen to podcasts. So I thought I might as well make a podcast of my own. All right, back to the PPEC. Uh, this stands for Physician Professional Hushbahinga Committee. I don't know what the E stands for, but it has something to do with quality assurance, quality check, to make sure that everything's going safely. And it's serious business, actually. I'm not even allowed to talk about it. Everything that goes on in that committee is completely confidential. And it should be because we are safeguarding patients seen and unseen against medical errors, preventable medical errors. So if there is a uh, practice drift or practice mistakes that go on on a, on a recurring basis, it would be our job to pick up on that. I did something similar to this when I was practicing in the military, but it was, it was like the laid back version. It was all outpatient, otherwise healthy Marines and sailors with the occasional, I don't even want to call it disease. It, the it, it was easy peasy, but this is uh, much 
this is dealing with much more complicated cases and I better just, I better stop talking about this cause I don't want to get in trouble. Is, I've, I've only been on the committee for like a day. So let's keep it, keep it moving, keep it moving. What else is going on this week? Uh, been active on X, X. So at the same time that I am recording this podcast and producing content weekly in direct signal audio, I'm also promoting the podcast on my X feed at 3 Deeper Cuts. So if you're listening to this, you want to check me out on X, go ahead and click, click uh, where, well, I don't know what you click, you just Go to x.com and look up 3D per cuts. Give me a follow. And uh, I just figured that we might as well promote this at the same time as we're creating it. Uh, simple as that. What else? Had some issues with the Olivetti the other week. Uh, nobody's busted my balls for using a typewriter. I, I've, I've yet to meet somebody who is, who's going to bust my balls for using a typewriter. But I swear by this thing. I think that typewriters and physical copy books are the antidote to the brain fry that occurs when you spend too much time staring at a screen, and you can't avoid that. Your daily work revolves around staring at a screen, and and it, I mean, you have to be on social media to promote the podcast. You have to interact with people. You have to build relationships. But I think the human brain can only take so much. So I'm very intentional about the tools that I use offline to keep myself centered. And also, I don't want my kids seeing me glued to a screen all the time. You might see me sprawled out on the couch, uh, replying to, you know, uh, commenting on posts or editing posts and stuff like that. But I try to ration that so that in the evenings unless I'm on a spaces and actually I just completely contradict contradict myself spaces is spaces is like a it is like a zoom call without the video and it's just a great way to talk to people and meet people on the internet who are like-minded and who are building similar projects as yourself and you just you just learn a lot from talking to people and shared experiences along the way but you still have to be staring at a screen so uh, this is the early phase i've only been on spaces for like a month now maybe less than that like more like two or three weeks since i've been like taking it seriously and i'm going to have to budget the amount of time that i spend on there so that I don't fry my brain. But bottom line, um, when I come back home, I don't even do audiobooks anymore. The only time I'll do an audiobook is like if I'm on a walk. And even then, I don't even do that many audiobooks. I'll usually, if I want to catch up on a podcast uh, for my entertainment or education, uh, my two favorite podcasts are Bill Burr Podcast, Monday Morning Podcast, and Founders Podcast. Those are like my go to beyond that tim ferris lex friedman what else um there's there's not a lot i, I actually re-listen to the same podcast over and over again i study them i just pick one that really resonates with me I, like the michael jordan episode on founders podcast i literally will re-listen to it I, I think i've listened to it at least 12 times already it, i just like to brain my brainwash myself with positivity and I, I bought the biography. I actually haven't finished it. I, I think I got a few, I got a couple chapters in and there's a lot of heinous stuff, by the way, that went on in Michael Jordan's early life that was not on that episode. And hats off to Senra, uh, uh, David Senra, who made the podcast, hats off to him for being very judicious with what he actually recorded into audio format. Uh, so if you, uh, well, enough said. Uh, the biogra biography is the one by Roland Lazenby, and I believe he also did one by Kobe, which I'd like to eventually read uh, next. What other? What else is going on? So we talked about the committee. We talked about the uh, typewriter. Oh, yeah, what was I going to say about the typewriter? I got this thing from this company in Spain that refurbishes these old typewriters, and they do an amazing job. It's, it's basically a brand new machine, but I had some issue with the backspace key and I was going back and forth with this guy on WhatsApp and on messaging. And it was, 
kind of annoying. Uh, he eventually sent me a video and I'll have to tinker around with it and see if I can get the thing to work because it, it's a flawless machine other than the fact the backspace key doesn't work. And I love using it, but it eats up like a little bit more time every time I have to use that backspace. Anyways, first world, first world problems. Okay. Yeah. All right. Other than that, uh, it was a busy week. It was a busy week. Just budgeting my time to record this for you, experimenting with new software, new hardware, and, uh, and figuring out when I'm going to have my next guest on the podcast. I know I told you it was going to be episode 100, but uh, I've actually met some interesting people on the interwebs, which uh, I feel would be of value to you, the listener. Some of you are physicians, some of you are lay people, and some of you are non-pathologists. Uh, maybe there might even I think there might be a nurse or two in the crowd, but none of us are exposed to the things that are available on the internet in terms of uh, marketing education, AI education, prompt writing education, image generation education, uh, understanding how uh, the X platform works. That's, that's basically where I spend all my non-medical time is just understanding how to build on X, how to network on the internet. These, these are all skills. Like these are hard skills that the next, that, you basically have, if, if you don't have a following on the internet, you basically don't exist. So that's why I'm putting in so much time to like learn this. I, I, I'm as socially awkward on the internet as I am in real life. Uh, and I don't say that to like talk down about myself. It's just, it's just a fact, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I mean, if you know me, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit of a recluse. And uh, so commenting on, commenting on a hundred posts a day is, incredibly awkward for me. I, I find it difficult to pretend to be interested in other people's materials and comment intelligibly other than, you know, like a one word, one word response. Um, so work in progress. So let's, let's get into it. This week's episode is going to be starting at chapter seven of No Lab for Old Men. If you want to catch chapters one through six, I did a live reading of those, uh, I believe, four episodes ago. So today, we are going to just plow right through this and and pick up where we left off. So in the preceding chapters, I think the last, the last scene was in the SMU gymnasium. And Frank is our lead character, and uh, the... They're playing a game of basketball, and the floor gives in and collapses, and in comes uh, this man, apparently from the future, and his name's Al, and he's driving this six-wheeler robot named Ollie that ground through the shale lining of the floor, and uh, and uh, nearly kills the basketball players. But he ends up being a really nice guy. And they they just, they help. So Al helps the college students up out of the collapsed floor into this chasm or canyon, if you will. And he helps them back onto the ledge. So, uh, so the last line is, Al waves to the smaller robot and the machine starts roving to Sean lowering its hydraulics for Sean to climb on. All right, here we go. Next chapter, chapter seven. Tilly and Rory stood by the punch bowl in the cab lab atrium for another 10 minutes before realizing it was more work to clog up the line than to stand aside and let the people through. That meant the possibility of not being the center of attention for a few minutes. And this bothered both of them. Rory was hired as CEO at Cab Lab eight years ago after a series of private equity-backed acquisitions of a chain of GI outpatient contracts. They bought practices in Tennessee and, South, and the Southeast and a smattering of small towns along Appala Appalachia. 
Most of the pathologists in those locales had retired. The local GI docs didn't know the difference between H. pylori and HIV. They could cut costs by batching all their specimens to cab lab with an air courier twice a week. Once they got going, nobody asked questions. Rory was a finance major from Indianapolis. He'd attended business school down in Bloomington, Indiana, and got his first job in sales at Eli Lilly after an MBA and a two-year stint at Deloitte. He was ready to get back into the healthcare business. Cab Lab was his first job as CEO. Who would hire a rookie CEO to manage the busiest outpatient reference lab from Texas to Alaska? A group of pathologists, that's who. The partners at Cab Lab were excellent diagnosticians. But you see, they just wanted to go home and play massively multiplayer online strategy games on the internet. Tilly was a Texas girl. She came to Cab Lab straight out of college at UT. She was a half-German, half-Irish firecracker, full of social energy. She played intramural tennis for a few semesters. Then she got into yoga. Tilly had a good life. She grew up in Pe Preston Hollow, the daughter of one of the founding partners at Cab Lab. Mom left when she was 13. It was traumatic. Casually scrolling Google when accidentally opening up her mom's Gmail to find provocative emails from a secret female lover. Didn't help that her mom's girlfriend was also one of the teachers at school. It was social suicide. Tilly shared a bond with her father, growing stronger through the years. Rory, I'm so glad we finally got the partners on board with this thing. Tilly, it was inevitable. They exchanged a forbidden caress under the cocktail table. Rory and Tilly shared a special bond, too, one that nobody knew about. Except for maybe Chaz the gorilla. More on that later. Rory, we should start rounding people up into the banquet hall. Tilly, we've been waiting for this moment for years. Rory smiles. He signals to Roberto, his chief of staff. Roberto, a stocky, mustached man from Guadalajara, Mexico. He nodded with affirmation. He let out a loud whistle, good enough to be construed as a cat call. Roberto, listen up, y'all. Hope everyone is enjoying the evening. At this time, we ask you to make your way to the reception hall. And everybody glanced up momentarily. With a few minutes delay, the room of 150-some pathologists, guests, and family members made their way across the cab lab atrium and into the banquet hall. Their mouths were full of juicy pieces of ham, tender pink slices dripping with grease. They were chewing and slurping, washing it down with a California Cabernet and orange punch. You could see one of them ambling forward, the pink ham flesh rising into pieces after slowly being clenched within his dull, coffee-stained incisors, his eyes watering with a fresh release of gastronomical dopamine. He had that lazy mealtime look, a white, wrinkled Oxford shirt with sweat stains and a missing button, an inner tube of abdominal fat jockeying for position over his belt and his mismatched chinos, two sizes too small, but generously stretched from the seams. With each lumbering step, you could see the leather in his shoes stretch in pathetic protest, only to be hoisted forward again and pounded on the pale, cool linoleum. Rory and Til Tilly were grooming themselves and each other in the little green room behind the stage, the IT staff lead and the operations officer were fitting them both with cavalier, with lavalier microphones. The room was gripped in a soothing murmur of banal details of on-off switches, channels, and battery packs for the microphones. Tilly, you got this baby, she said softly behind Rory's chair. Rory smiled. 
Let's go. Rory and Tilly emerged from the green room, each dusting each other's back with a travel-sized lint brush. The two of them made a great pair. They complemented each other's weaknesses. Rory was cool, calculative, and deceptive. Tilly was social, nurturing, and flamboyant. Both of them equally ruthless. The two of them slowly walked out onto the stage. In their eyes, a twinkle of triumph. Tilly takes the microphone. Tilly, good evening, Cab Lab. She pauses, feedback reverberating from the stage. Crowd, good evening, with faint belches and chewing noises in the background. Tilly, and Merry Christmas. She sips a glass of water, ice cubes clinking into the microphone. This is an exciting time for Cab Lab. A large white screen lowers behind her. We added three new contracts this year. Applause break. Our academic partners published 10 scholarly publications in the last 24 months. And our laboratory animals have never been happier. She says, reading from the teleprompter. Wait. That can't be right. Rory nudges her from behind. Pathologists, not laboratory animals. Tilly, oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) The orange punch got the best of us. Our pathologists have never been happier, as evidenced by our recent company-wide 360-degree evaluations. Two waiters are standing on the far wall, off to the back corner of the reception hall, They are leaning into the wall, taking discreet sips of assorted fountain beverages and cocktails. Waiter number one whispers to the colleague, 360-degree evaluation. Waiter number two, sipping his glass, scanning the room casually. It's not fancy. They just swivel their chairs around in a full circle while giving sandwiched feedback. It's a sight to behold, actually. They use those Herman Miller chairs with double-A bearings. Sometimes you catch janitors swiveling around in those things after hours. Lab animals, too. Waiter number one, you mean the pathologist? Waiter number two, no, the actual lab animals. Legend has it, they have a gorilla somewhere down there. Waiter number one, down where? Waiter number two, in the boiler room. The running theory is that cab lab is that the cab... Cab Lab Gorilla was responsible for that break-in at the Dallas Zoo last summer. Waiter number one. Really? I wouldn't have guessed. But those animals are always playing dumb. Took my kid there last month, and the orangutan was flinging spitballs at my wife. Tilly. You may have noticed some inspectors walking around parts of Cab Lab over the last few months... These skilled professionals are from Comet Healthcare, based out of Munich, Germany. I'll let your CEO, Rory Jones, take it from here. Rory, stepping up to the microphone and clearing his throat. throat) Colleagues, as you can see on the PowerPoint slides behind me, Cab Lab's revenue has grown steadily by 3% over the last eight quarters. This is astounding to our outside auditors. It reflects the superb work that you all do every day. Rory points to the graph. You see, although our GI business and GU businesses took an 80% reduction for three months in 2020, we were able to cut the cost by doing away with our 8% employee 401k match. Waiter number two, his mouth dropping open wide. That's outrageous. How did they get away with that? Waiter number one, I don't know. Can you get us some popcorn? This is getting interesting. Rory, now I know what you may be thinking. How could we do this? Let me tell you, it was not an easy decision. But after many nights of long meetups with the partners of Cab Lab, Rory looks out into the crowd, some of whom are with us tonight. It was agreed upon that these cost-cutting measures were required to make the business more attractive to outside investors. The audience making slurping noises, chewing noises, loudly. Tilly stepping up to the mic and taking it gently from Rory. It gives us great pleasure to announce to you all, her voice escalating with excitement, that Cab Lab 
is now, as of January 1st, going to be a wholly owned subsidiary of Comet Healthcare. Celebratory music of Van Halen's hit song, Jump, blast from the, spe- from the speakers on either side of the stage. Rory, leaning in and whispering in Tilly's ear, Great job, sweetheart. They're taking it well. Rory moves in and holds the microphone. And in a confident voice, continues, Now there will be some pinch points over the next few weeks as we comply with Comet Health's lab staffing targets. Please refresh your emails on an hourly basis during the work week. Waiter number one. Oh, snap. They dropped the bomb. He says, I'm munching popcorn and sipping his cola. Waiter number two. I must admit, uh, that was a smooth way of telling them. Oh, also 25% of you are going to get canned. (laughs) Tilly's eyes are shimmering with glee. It has been an absolute privilege serving you pathologists as your premier management team. We will be around the office to answer any questions you may have over the next few weeks. Enjoy the rest of your dinner and save room for dessert. Merry Christmas to all of you. The music transitions to contemporary jazz as Rory and Tilly walk off the stage and back into the green room. Rory sits down in a plush recliner, pouring two glasses of brandy. That went by easier than we planned. Tilly, you were amazing, baby. Tilly slithers across the room and on to Rory's armchair, descending into his lap and straddling him. She and Rory melt together in, into a long, forbidden kiss. The door opens. It's Roberto. Roberto, Mr. Rory, we have a problem. Rory, standing up, Tilly falling off of him and onto the floor like a stray tabby cat. And what's that, Alberto? Rory, wiping his fresh lipstick from his face. Roberto, uh, you know zero, sir? A6M zero? Yeah. That's the problem. He's missing. What do you mean, missing? There's three feet of concrete between him and the nearest HVAC. Tilly, rising from the floor and straightening out her dress. How does a 400-pound gorilla get into the HVAC? Roberto, we found some empty C4 explosive canisters in his quarters. There's a big hole in his wall near the event bathrooms. Rory, you think it was an inside job? Roberto, well, it's an outside job now. Tilly, I like what you did there, Roberto. Rory, this isn't funny. We need to get that gorilla back into Cab Lab ASAP. He's half the reason Comet Healthcare added on that extra $20 million at the end of the negotiation. That gorilla has the most expensive DNA this side of the equator. If we don't find him, the Comet acquisition's off. The camera fades out. To be continued. Chapter 8. One by one, Frank and Al hoisted the three young men up the side of the chasm. Jefferson came first, probably because he was the most lame. For an average 70-kilogram man, the required effort was tremendous. Al directed the front of the rope. Frank secured the leading edge to the base of the bleachers, about 15 yards behind them. He gripped the rope tightly, leaning into the forward position, Frank put his shoulders forward and his head up. And 15 yards ahead, the back end of the bleachers looked opaque with the black air and settling dust. Skittering noises faded in and out. A familiar crackling noise crescendoed toward Frank's end of the rope. It got louder. Then his right foot kicked something weighty on the floor of the gymnasium. Frank paused. He patted the floor with his feet. First the right foot, Then the left. Nothing. Al, his voice faintly calling from the background. You doing all right there, bub? We almost got the second one. Frank didn't respond. Instead, he dropped to his hands and knees on the dusty gymnasium floor. Frank pinned the rope to the floor with his knee, pressing down firmly with his body weight, oblivious to the fact that grown man's body weight was on the other end of the rope. After a few excruciating moments, he found the object, grasped it in his hand, and raised it to eye level. In his back pocket was a pen light. He pulled it out and read the back of the object. It read, The Panasonic Corporation, 1973. 
and it had an empty slot for four AA batteries. Frank flipped the object over and identified it as a portable transistor radio, emitting a crackling noise. An aluminum speaker covered the front surface of the radio. There was an analog AM-FM dial. The corners of the radio were painted with sticky clotted blood, grit, and bits of hair. Some of it stuck under Frank's fingernails. A chill ran down his spine. His neck muscles tensed up. He flipped the radio back over to confirm there were no batteries in the slots, yet it still produced an eerie crackling sound. He toggled the dial and stopped at the first audible station. An unusual opera tenor line sprang into the dark air from the speaker, drifting up through the blackness between the rising benches of bleachers and up into the rafters. A firm hand grips Frank on the left shoulder. The hand is accompanied by a raspy voice. The voice... Looks like you found my radio, partner. Frank, jumping forward into a somersault behind the nearest bench. What are you? The voice. The blood's from my dog's dinner last night. Damn fool. Brought in a rabbit from the kitchen garden. Of course you would get to work disemboweling the thing on my radio. Dadgum dog. Mama wanted to put the thing out of his misery last fall when we found out he had a tumor on his gums. But the vet took the thing off. Made a deal with me over some coffee. Or excuse me, over some office landscaping. What do you know? Squamous cell carcinoma of the dog's oral cavity. Who'd have thunk it? Boy's got a dip in right now. Even after I done told him not to. You know how that goes. Do as I say, not as I do. Frank. Your dog chews tobacco? voice. Only on holidays. At least that was the agreement. Nowadays, now that Mama's gone, he gets his way. Jefferson, from the edge of the chasm. Frank, is that you back there? Frank, I'm on my way back with, what did you say your name was? The voice. Didn't. Talking Boar is my name. Frank, Can I call you Boar? The voice. It's dark in here, and I can still tell you're white. White man always been trying to give us their names. Wiped out most of our villages. Took all our horses. Not without a few hundred scalps, mind you. You better believe it. Frank. Can we go now? Nothing personal, but I got a couple of guys over there hanging off the ledge of this chasm. One of them has a broken ankle and possibly internal bleeding. The voice, of course. Actually, call me Bob. Let's go, Bob. I'll grab some of the slack in this rope. Bob reaches down and grips the loose end of the rope, following Frank's lead back to the edge of the chasm and in front of the bleachers. It's evening now, and sunset enters the gymnasium, reflecting off the awards against the high wall. The light shines on Bob as he emerges into the open area of the gymnasium. Bob walks forward slowly, a gangly, tan-skinned Native American man with a long gray-white braided ponytail down the back of his plaid western shirt with pearl buttons. He wore broken-in wranglers and a pair of well-cared-for brown cowboy boots. His pockets bulged with the outline of a wallet and at his side a hunting knife. His arms showed a reddish-brown leather skin with faded tattoos, an anchor, a heart, and a skull. He was lean and hungry-looking. His menacing stance was offset by his gentle smile and crow's feet along his eyes. Jefferson, lying horizontal on the first set of bleachers. What? Al, looking down at Jefferson. He's in a lot of pain. We need to get him to a hospital. Frank, kneeling down and checking his pulse. He's tachycardic. We need to get him out of here. Jefferson, are you with me? Don't go to sleep, bud. We're going to get you checked out. The rope wiggles off the side of the chasm. Al, the last one's on his way up. Sean breathes heavily as he hoists himself up the final stretch of the rope. He raises his gaze and meets eyes with the six-foot Native American man smiling in his direction. The crackling radio sifting through the air, and in a stupor of exhaustion and shock, Sean grips open and he nearly falls back down the rope into the abyss. Al dives toward the rope. 
Oh, no, you don't. He grabs the rope in one hand and Sean's wrist in the other. In a Herculean motion of chest strength, bringing the young man to safety of the ledge. Al, okay, listen, fellas, I'll be brief. I'm from the future, 2016 to be specific. I don't know how to hail a cab in, uh, what year is it, anyways? Jefferson, 1987, in a tired, breathless voice. Bob, my name's Bob, mister. Looks at Frank, inquisitively. Frank, his name's Al. Yeah, we just met him a minute ago. He burrowed through the gymnasium wall with a robot down there named Ollie. Bob, Mr. Al, are those earphones you have there? Al, yes, they are, Bob. He hands the earbuds over to Bob generously. If I get this transistor radio to between 600 and 800 AM channels, I can sometimes intercept frequencies of the ambulances going up and down Harry Hines Boulevard. Sean, let's give it a shot. I don't know how much longer Jefferson is going to hold out. Frank, thanks, Bob. Let's head down to the south end of the double doors. Next. Chapter 9. Chaz. How'd I get here? Jimmy, you act like that's an unreasonable question. Ron, stop badgering him. Let him talk. Chaz, what do you say we get out of here and get some coffee? It's on me. Jimmy and Ron exchange a, glant, exchange a look at each other. Jimmy looks around and finds a broom from the janitor's closet and starts sweeping up the rubble from the bathroom. Ron slowly joins him nervously brushing dust from the floor with a towel. Chaz gets up, stands between them, and holds up his hands gently. A soft look of empathy gleams from his eyes. Chaz, don't worry about the mess, fellas. I worked it out with the catering staff last week. They'll get this taken care of. Chaz saunters between them and towards the bathroom entrance. Ron, taken care of? You think Cab Lad's not going to notice a 400-pound gorilla just blasted through a bathroom wall with C4 explosive? Jazz. I got them courtside to the first five Mavericks games of the season. We'll be all right. Jimmy dusts off his arms and legs, walking towards his new silverback gorilla acquaintance. Jimmy. I know a place on Grenville with decent cold brew and snacks. Jazz. Let's go, amigo. Ron pulls out his albuterol inhaler and takes two good drags. <sighs> All right, then. Coffee. The three new friends walk across Harry Hines Boulevard and pile into Ron's 2011 Tahoe. The back gate fits Chaz perfectly. Jim fills, Jimmy fills into the shotgun seat. They start the engine and pull around into traffic. They drive the three miles into the coffee shop in an awkward silence. Chaz, you want to put on some jazz? Jimmy, you got it, buddy. Gentle contemporary jazz tunes play over the SUV radio sound system. After two songs, they pull into the parking lot of Silent Brew, a sleek hipster coffee shop off Lower Grenville Avenue. Ron pulls into spacious parking slot into the back near the dumpsters, hoping not to draw too much attention. It has the opposite effect. Two attractive college girls are passing by on their way. Hey, Chaz. Chaz, with one leg out of the Tahoe, turns his head around and smiles. Girls, good to see you. If you don't mind, could one of you order me an iced latte and get something for yourselves on me? Girl number one. Anything for Chaz? See you inside. She blows a kiss in the direction of the Tahoe. Jimmy, stepping out of the passenger seat. You know these people? Chaz, what can I say, Jimmy? I got friends. He winks and slams the Tahoe door shut. Ron turns off the ignition and walks around the vehicle in surprise. Ron, I can't believe my eyes. Say, why didn't you have them order us some coffee too? Jimmy, Ron, don't abuse the gorilla's magnetic charm. Chaz, pulling Jimmy and Ron in close to him with his large, furry arms. All right, fellas, odds are you've never been in public with a 400-pound gorilla. 
Let me tell you something. It's important to stay cool throughout this whole time. Humans are weird about anxiety. You just walk in like Robert De Niro in the movie Heat, like you own the damn place. Jimmy, you got it. Chaz, and another thing. Ron, what's that? Chaz, don't touch the back of my head. Got that? Jimmy, sure, but what's that about? Chaz, in the primate world, it's a sign of aggression. If you touch the back of my head, I won't be able to resist my biological urge to fight you. Further, it'll prompt other human alpha males in the area, assuming they're already in this bougie fucking place, to challenge me, and that won't end well. Ron, what are you so worried about? Chaz, I'm not worried about me. I'm worried about you. If we get into a brawl, I'm going to end up smashing dude's head open, and it's back to the slammer we go. Guy like me, I'm already institutionalized from that basement at Cab Lab. Confinement suits me. But you people won't last in confinement. Jimmy, like the guy from Shawshank Redemption. Chaz, sure. Jimmy, relax, man. Nobody's going to touch the back of your head. Ron, not even a playful tap? Jimmy, Ron, stop. Let's just go get some coffee and hash this situation out. The three of them walk up to the coffee shop with a big silent brew sign posted out front. There's a Western-style patio with a couple half-empty Modelo bottles and some cracked peanut shells out front. Chaz casually walks in the front door. He looks at the waiter on one corner and the barista on the other. The barista gives a quick signal and directs Chaz with her eyes to the back of the seating area, where a small door leads to a private patio. Ron whispers to Jimmy, Man, this guy's got it figured out. Jimmy, you're telling me. The waiter leads the three of them to the back patio where the two girls from the parking lot are sipping frappe drinks and exchanging laughs about their work. Girl number one. Chaz, come here, you big goober. She gets up and gives him a sensual hug, lacing her arms around his furry torso. You were supposed to call me, remember? Chaz, I'm sorry, sweetheart. You know how things get in the immune lab with new antibodies? Girl number one. I'll spare you the awkwardness of forgetting our names. My name's Grace and this is Leslie. Leslie, how do you do, Chaz? Do you remember me from New Year's? Chaz, smiling and glances at the waiter. Of course I do. New Year's, how could I forget? Grace, forget? You silly willy. Nobody forgets when you break into the Dallas Zoo and take off with one of the lions. (laughs) Chaz, you are one of the greats. Chaz, let me introduce my friends Jimmy and Ron. Chaz ushers them forward and gives his friends chairs at the table. The five of them settle in around the large, irregularly shaped coffee table constructed of distressed wood. The girls provide a warm, friendly energy. The rich notes of fairly traded Arabica beans are filtering through the shop and off the back patio. Chaz is at the head of the table, near the sliding door. It's not crowded, but an occasional patron walks back and forth. Ron and Jimmy are on the far side, looking towards the shop. The girls are sitting opposite them. Ron, it's not a slammer, by the way. Jimmy, pleasure to meet you, Grace and Leslie. Sounds like you know Chaz quite well. Ron, they would tranquilize you and send you back to the research area. Grace, the pleasure is all ours. Any friend of Chaz is a friend of the uptown girls. Leslie, chiming in, that's the name of our personnel company. Ron. I don't know why you call it a slammer. They would never send you there. You're an endangered species for crying out loud. Chaz, you talking to me? Looking at Ron. Ron, of course I'm talking to you. No, the other 400-pound time-traveling gorilla on this patio. Jimmy, time-traveling? Grace, sounds like your friends have some unanswered questions, Chaz, as she sips the foam from her coffee with a sultry grin. Grace, Why are you so secretive anyways? If I was in your shoes, I'd love to tell my story to everyone. Ron. Fortunate gorilla. Chaz. That's enough out of you, Ron. I've only known you two hours and you're already pissing me off. And finally, Grace, I don't wear shoes. My feet have a black leathery veneer, which I'm proud of. Shoes are for you human savages. And yes, Ron, there was a time when my research classification afforded me exemption from some human laws. My patent expired two years ago, however. Now if I screw up, they'll try me as an adult. Ron, an adult ape or adult human? Jimmy, Jesus, Ron, would you just let it go? Chaz, you can put an end to this discussion by telling us how you got there in the first place.
Leslie and Grace in unison. Yes, please. Chaz, fine. Chaz leans back in his chair and pulls a pack of cigarettes from, his ins- from inside his furry chest pocket. He looks off into the night sky beyond the cafe fiesta lights. He takes a long drag and exhales. Chaz, okay, my real name isn't Chaz. That's something the catering staff at Cab Lab gave me back some time ago. My real name is A6M0. I was born in the Congo in 1974, around the time Muhammad Ali did that special fight with George Foreman. Back then, they called it Zaire. With the influx of tourists over the next 10 years, there was a movement of avant-garde scientists who were doing all kinds of longevity experiments. One of the doctors was this guy from Newport Beach, California, who needed subjects to experiment with a new drug. It wasn't really a drug. It was a nano drug with the ability to lash onto human telomeres and delay the process of aging. It was banned in six European countries at the time. I had a young family to support back in the jungle, so I was willing to do just about anything. In fact, I was trying to get into the lab game with a couple unsuccessful attempts in the years following the rumble in the jungle. Leslie, what's a telomere? Chaz, it's the end of a DNA strand. They get shorter as people age. In theory, you could add on a hundred more years of life. Jimmy, you had a family? Chaz, yes, Jimmy. In those days, circa 1978, I was a strapping young gorilla with two kids and a hunger to create a better life for them. But I was reckless. The income from the longevity experiments put my kids through the best school for gorillas in the suburbs of Kinshasa. But I began to take unnecessary risks. I wanted to buy a house on Lake Victoria. I was away talking to lenders when the Civil War broke out. When I came back to our jungle enclave, gorillas, human gorillas, had taken my family. It was the saddest day of my life. Leslie, you poor thing, reaching over and placing her hand on his head, on Chaz's hand. Chaz, from that day forward, I was obsessed with coming to America. That would be the only way to buy my family back from the gorillas. The Congo was a dangerous place back then, and frankly, it still is today. Ron, did the doctor from Newport Beach get you an animal work permit? Chaz, sort of. His name is Angel. He might still be on the coast or down in Baja, California. At the time, he didn't need any animals in his clinical practice. But he knew a guy in Ramona, a small town in the mountains outside of San Diego, with an antibody farm. Angel agreed to keep me on as his patient if I helped him, if I helped his friend in Ramona. I would donate serum every month. More importantly, he kept me on as recruiter. Jimmy, fascinating leaning forward. Chaz, the so-called Brown Revolution was just beginning to take off in the 1980s. The demand for monoclonal antibodies was exploding. Mice, rabbits, goats, they were all needed. The guy who ran the farm, Rob Laverne, was inundated with new orders and had a big-name university client, had, and had big-name university system clientele. The only problem was he didn't speak mouse, rabbit, or goat, let alone Spanish mouse, rabbit, or... <clears throat> Goat, said Ron, chiming in. So he brings on a lab gorilla from Zaire as his new head of recruiting. Grace, hang on a second. Brown Revolution? Was that the thing where Idi Amin threw out all the Indian people? Jimmy, it's messed up that you would think that, Grace. But Brown Revolution refers to the rise of immunohistochemistry and surgical pathology. Leslie, immuno who? Chaz, thanks, Jimmy. And yes, that's absolutely correct. With every tissue type, every tissue type has a unique antigen on the cell surface. Even the transcription factors in the cell nucleus can steer the pathologist to a site of origin diagnosis, which was previously impossible. Ron, chiming in, I had never worked up a tissue diagnosis with gorilla polyclonal antibodies until I got to cab lab. The antigen retrieval was better, in my experience. Leslie, is that gorilla blood, huh? Chaz, well, I don't know about all that. All I know is that Rob Laverne and I had a good run during the five years we worked in the San Diego market. He let me pretty much run my own show in terms of recruiting new animals. You'd be surprised about how many different breeds of rabbit there are. He offered full employee benefits and a generous profit-sharing plan for all the rabbits and mice. Ron, not the goats? 
Chaz, not the goats. I never did understand what the old man Rob had against the goats. I mean, he had a, hus- he had a dozen llamas up there at the farm, and I always thought those were Latin American goats. Ron, goats and llamas are completely different animals. Why would, you, why would he think that? Jimmy, stay in your lane, Ron. What are you, a llama expert now? Ron, I'm just saying, it's kind of hypocritical. Chaz, whatever the reason, that's the way the old man ran the farm, and it led to a schism between the animals. All of them used to play together in the front pen, mouse, rabbit, and goat alike. Over time, the mice developed their own hierarchy, and so did the rabbits. Brawls would break out in the yard, especially when the goats started running low on serum. You could get like three batches of antibodies from a single goat, whereas a good-sized rabbit would yield half a batch at best. So the goats got the superiority complex and felt like they would start policing the yard. Grace, like the sisters? Jimmy, from Shawshank Redemption? Ron, I like what you did there. Chaz, I didn't do anything. This wasn't a joke. These were real animals with families for crying out loud. A mouse should never grow up seeing his father mauled by a goat. Leslie, but they have hooves, right? Chaz, whatever. Hooves, paws, fine. They were trampled, not mauled. Bottom line is that I was complicit in the atrocities that went on at that farm in Ramona. Chaz takes a long drag from his cigarette and stares off into the hazy Dallas twilight. It haunts me to this day. Jimmy, Chaz, you can't beat yourself up over this. You did it for your family. Leslie, you poor thing. She reaches over, touching the ape's hand. Chaz, the next seven years of the late 80s and early 90s were rocky for me. Ron, wait, what happened to the longevity doctor from Newport Beach? Chaz, Angel Lopez? Yes. Well, to his credit, I owe my entire life to his treatment with TEL1 inhibitors. The fact that I'm sitting you today sipping coffee is nothing short of a miracle. Jimmy. So the drug worked. Chaz. It did. But the feds came after Angel. Raided his private ranch in the Avocado Hills outside of Escondido. Angel always told me he finished medical school in Mexico and fully and was fully licensed in California, but I guess there were some holes in that story, and the feds weren't buying it. He didn't keep up with his CME for a couple years, and that's how they got him. Also, there were some mid-level providers up that ranch doing colonics for cash-paying Europeans. That didn't help his case. Jimmy, colonics? Ron, yeah, it's something where they put baking soda into an enema and squirted it up your ass. It's supposed to alkalize your blood. Jimmy, you sound familiar with this. Ron, yeah, well, you're not the only one with a gluten allergy. Look, I was desperate. I hadn't shit in two weeks. Jimmy, that's impossible. I think you just wanted a moonlighting nurse practitioner to give you a colonic. You're just that kind of guy, aren't you? The girls snicker across the table. Ron, shut up, Jimmy. Chaz, take it easy, guys. It doesn't matter anyways because they shut the entire ranch down. I remember it like it was yesterday. You drive out there amongst the groves of avocado and grapefruit trees, the bright California sunshine. It was an idyllic little enclave off the back entrance of Palomar Mountain. My friend Henry used to ride his Kawasaki Ninja out there. It's really too bad. Grace. So you couldn't get your treatments anymore? Chaz. Nope. But then I'd been getting them for years. I didn't need them anymore. I guess the drug had permanently altered every telomere in my body. Grace. Something else. Sips coffee and wonder. Leslie. So you get to live forever? Chaz. Gosh, I hope not. I'm already pushing twice the longevity of a normal normal silverback gorilla. I've seen enough pain in my life. I just need a way to... F- I just need to find a way back to Zaire. Or the Congo. And see if any of my descendants are still alive. Leslie, turning to Grace. We've got to help him. Ron. So what happened in the seven years in between, before the partners and Rory brought you to Cab Lab? Chaz. I went down a dark path, Ron. Really don't like talking about it. I was doing odd jobs across Arizona and New Mexico. 
work in construction and later on as a line cook in a diner in Albuquerque. I got into meth. Some nights I would sleep between the rail cars and outside of town when I couldn't make rent. Most of my savings I'd already wired back home to my family. Hopefully the funds actually went to my kids. I was living month to month in a studio apartment behind that diner. I grew to love the place. The owner got me into jujitsu. I stopped smoking meth and put myself wholly into martial arts training. The gym became my family. Jimmy, a 400-pound gorilla doing jujitsu in the desert. Never heard that one before. So when did you meet Rory? Chaz, at work. One night, I was covering the swing shift, and this guy walks in. Crisp, sh crisp shirt, black hair, and tailored pants. He looked tired and hungry. The hostess sat him down. I could hear her laughing from where I was by the grill. The two of them seemed to have an immediate connection. The guy would come in and out of the diner over the next few weeks. One evening, I saw him in the parking lot on my way in. He was real extroverted, the kind of guy you want to talk to. So we got talking, and he mentioned he works as a business manager at a, at a lab over on the other side of town in Dallas. He said they were the biggest menu of immunostains in Texas and probably the Southwest. My eyes lit up. He could tell I was interested. So we went inside and shared a cup of coffee, told him about my background in research and my skill set I'd learned working on that farm in Ramona. He was impressed with my pedigree and my work experience, pretty much hired me on the spot, said he could use a gorilla like me at Cab Lab in Dallas. I tempered my enthusiasm. It was a chance for me to start fresh again and reinvent myself. I didn't ask too many questions. I was on a flight the next week, and the rest is history. Okay, that is the end of chapter 9. Let's see, what else do we have left? We have chapter 10, and then we're all caught up. So, let's just let's stick with the rule of three. So, this time around, we did 7, 8, and 9. I'm going to leave you with that. And once I get a little bit more ink on paper, maybe we'll do another uh, another preview of No Lab for, for old, old Men. And hopefully we'll have the manuscript done by next August. So this has been a fun, another fun episode of Three, Three Deeper Cuts podcast. I thank you very much for tuning in. And that will be all for this episode. Three Deeper Cuts is the lifestyle magazine for the practicing surgical pathologists and enthusiasts of human disease, bringing you high signal content fueled by 10% buffered neutral formalin. Hope you enjoyed listening. If you like this content, subscribe to the newsletter at 3deepercuts.substack.com. And we are now on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. What else? And YouTube. We are, we are now on YouTube as well. So thanks again for your attention. And I hope you have an excellent rest of your day or rest of your week. And going into the weekend, professors, until next time, stay curious, be well, stay healthy. I'm your host, Chuck G, and we'll see you next time.